Hello again, everyone. This is Arat Kabar, here as always, seeking the truth. Uh, I have another brother in the truth who's going to be bringing forth the reading for me today. Go ahead and introduce yourself. Shalom, family. I'm Brother Yassa. So again, Brother Yassa, he's going to be bringing forth the scriptures as I'm going over the commentary for today's lesson. So the name of this lesson is going to be the core doctrines and beliefs of this channel. Okay. Uh, throughout the, the course of me making videos and lessons, people have always asked me, you know, well, what exactly do you believe? What exactly is, is, is your understanding of the scriptures? Um, and like I said, my videos, they're always normally tailored towards one specific thing. Uh, so I can't revert back to one video to kind of give a general understanding of, you know, how we understand to, to read the Bible. So hopefully throughout this video, we're going to hit on a, a lot of key topics to give people the understanding of where they should start if they want to, like I said, understand the Bible and the scriptures. So to start off with, we're going to go to the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20. This is the book of 2 Peter, chapter 1, verse 20. Knowing this first, that no prophecy of the scripture is of any private interpretation. So just as the scripture said, knowing this first, that uh, the Bible is of no private interpretation, meaning that everything in the Bible was written by holy men that were inspired through the Holy Spirit. So no one can sit here and say that the Bible was written by man, um, you know, that you know, because it was written by man, that it's not God's word. The, the Holy Bible is God's authoritative word that was given to us for instructions on how to seek him and how to live a righteous life. Also, when we're going through the Bible and reading the Bible, no one should be able to read a certain scripture or verse and say, well, this is what I think that scripture means to me. And it's OK if it means something different to you. It's not up for private interpretation. However, I read the Bible and understand that context. Someone else should read the Bible and have that same uh, understanding of that context. It's not up for, for debate about, well, this says this, but it means something else. No, we take the Bible for face value and God's word means what it means. OK, the next thing we're going to read is actually coming from the Apocrypha, the book of Sirach, um, also known as the book of Ecclesiasticus. So we're going to read a small portion of the prologue. We're not going to read the whole thing. But again, we're going to read a small portion to get an understanding of the language that the Bible was originally written in. All right. So this is from the prologue of the book of Sirach. Or Ecclesiasticus. Wherefore, let me entreat you to read it with favor and attention, and to pardon us, wherein we may seem to come short of some words which we have labored to interpret. For the same things uttered in Hebrew and translated into another tongue have not the same force in them. So, so far we see, excuse me, Salakia, so far when we see that in the translation of the Bible, that the original language was the Hebrew language. But during the translation, going from Greek into English and so on and so forth, some words actually lost their power or their force or their understanding. So it's imperative for us to understand the Hebrew language because if not, when we're reading certain things in English, we might not have the full understanding of that topic because the words in, in our English language don't have the same understanding as the Hebrew. A small example, um, in our English language, we see that Christ was born of a virgin. And in English, we assume that to mean that Christ's parents did not have intercourse. But when you have an understanding of the Hebrew language, we understand that a virgin is simply a woman of marriageable age, not denoting whether she's had intercourse or not. So again, that's just a small example. For, for, for further information, I do have a video specifically on that very topic, just as all of the other things I'm gonna be going over today. If there's a specific uh, doctrinal question or belief that you want more understanding on, I should go ahead and click through the playlist and I should have a video or a playlist of videos that go on that uh, same topic. But again, continue reading. And not only these things, but the law itself and the prophets and the rest of the books have no small difference when they are spoken in their own language. So, like, he's, like, like it was said, everything going from the law to the prophets and even the New Testament, everything that was written, you kind of lose a little bit of force when it's not spoken of in its original language, which again, that original language is the Hebrew language. The next scripture is coming from the book of 2 Timothy, 
chapter 3 verse 16 This is the book of 2 Timothy, chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture is given by inspiration of the Most High, and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. So, just like I said, as I mentioned earlier, all scripture, the whole Bible, was inspired by holy righteous men. And the purpose of the Bible was used, was created to reprove and rebu rebuke and correct each other like I said the Bible is an instruction booklet on life how do we live and worship the Most High how do we uh, keep our temples our, which mean our bodies holy and how do we interact with other people throughout the world okay so all of that that's the first doctrinal belief understanding and believing in the Bible is God's authoritative word and believing that the Bible is God's authoritative word so the next uh, doctrinal belief is believing and understanding that the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the father of all creation. He's the God that is supposed to be feared above all other gods. Okay? First scripture is coming from the book of Exodus chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. This is the book of Exodus chapter 3, verse 13. And Moses said unto the Most High, Behold, when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them, The power of your fathers have sent me unto you, and they shall say to me, What is his name? What shall I say unto them? So here we see that Moses is getting ready to uh, lead the children of Israel out of Egypt. But before he does that, he actually asks the Most High what his name is. And we're going to see how the Most High responds. Continue. And the Most High said unto Moses, I am that I am. He says what? I am that I am. Continue. And he said, Thus shall thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me unto you. So, again, um, knowing the, and understanding the Hebrew language, we see that the Most High replied, I am. When you understand the Hebrew language, I am is, uh, is translated to Ahia. Or I am that I am is Ahaya Ashar Ahaya. So that is the Most High's name. So that's the next doctrinal understanding. Knowing and understanding that the Most High is the creator of all. He's the father of all. And that his name is Ahaya Ashar Ahaya. And then we'll stop on that one. Uh, the next topic or next scripture is coming from the book of uh, Psalms chapter 96 verses 4 through 5. Again, the next scripture is coming from the book of Psalm, chapter 96, verse 4 through 5. This is the book of Psalms, chapter 96, verses 4 and 5. For the Most High is great, and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. So, this scripture is saying that the Most High is to be feared above all other gods. So, that is already an indicator that there is more than one God in the earth. Or that is being utilized in the earth. Continue. Verse 5. For all the gods of the nations are idols, but the Most High made the heavens. So the gods of the other nations are all idols. Again, when it's saying the other nations, it's referring to the other nationalities. So, for example, the, the Arab nation or nationality of Arabs has a god subscribed to that nationality. And in that nationality or that god... They have an idol that subscribes to that, referring to the Kaaba stone. Okay, again, so that's just a small example. But all other gods other than the creator, which has created all gods, um, has an idol subscribed to it. So if there's a god out there that has a certain idol that you're supposed to pray to or give reverence to, that god has nothing to do with the father. That's not Ahia. Okay, the next scripture is coming from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23 verses 26 through 27. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 23, verse 26 and 27. How long shall this be in the heart of the prophets that prophesy lies? Yea, they are prophets of the deceit of their own heart. Verse 27. Mm -hmm. Which think to cause my people to forget my name by their dreams, which they tell every man to his neighbor, 
as their fathers have forgotten my name for Baal. So here we see in the scriptures that even back during the prophet's time, that the children of Israel forgot the Most High's name. And in forgetting the Most High's name, they began to worship Baal. So all of the gods that in earth that are being worshipped today all resort back to the same worship of Baal. Okay? Any name that is not associated with the Haya Ashara Haya and his son Yeshaya, which again we'll get into that, um, are names that are associated with Baal. So gods like Jehovah, gods like Yahweh, um, gods like Allah, all of these other gods are gods that are that are one subscribed to idols and also is not associated with the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Okay. So the next doctrinal understanding is understanding that Christ is actually the son of the Most High. And he came through the physical seed of David. To get this uh, understanding, the next scripture is coming from the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. This is the book of Romans, chapter 1, verses 3 through 5. Concerning his son, Yeshua Christ, our Lord. Be concerning, start over, say that again. Concerning his son, mm -hmm. Yeshua Christ, our Lord. So we see that it's referring to Christ as the son, the son of the Most High. And for further edification, Christ's actual name is Yeshua, which means my Savior. Now again, in your English Bibles, you will see that translated to Jesus. Once again, I have another video uh, that breaks down the name of, of Christ and also breaks down that he's actually the son of God versus being God himself. But again, start from the top and read that again. This is the book of Romans, chapter 1, verse 3. Concerning his son, Yeshua Christ, our Lord, which was made of the seed of David according to the flesh. So it says that Christ was made of the seed of David according to the flesh, which again, going back to what I stated earlier, a lot of people, because they don't have the understanding of the Hebrew language, believe that Christ was born without a physical father. But that's because they don't understand the Hebrew language. Even in the scripture, it states that he was born of the seed, which is a physical thing that comes from a man uh, of David. Continue. Verse 4. And declare it to be the son of the Most High with power, mm -hmm. according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. So, like I said, once again, he's also referred to as the son of the Most High. This is not Christ being referred to as God or the Father himself. Okay? Verse 5. By whom we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name. And it's also through Christ that we're able to receive the gift of eternal life. Okay? Or the resurrection of the dead. Okay, but you have to believe first on Christ in order to even get to the Father. The next scripture is coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21. And we're going to see the purpose of, of Christ coming into the earth and also the function of his name. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 1, verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son. And thou shalt call his name Yeshua. So this is uh, Christ being born. Again, in Hebrew culture, when a person was born, their name had a significance to their meaning. If someone was born there and their name was given, their name had a meaning as to why they were born. So Christ, when he was born, his mother called him Yeshua. And again, read that again. Why? What was the purpose of his name? Verse 21. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Yeshua. For? For he shall save his people from their sins. For he shall save his people from his sins. So the purpose of Christ's name needs to mean save or savior. Which again, when you look up the Hebrew of the, of the word save or savior, you get the name Yeshua. So again, there's just another example how understanding the Hebrew language gives you the proper understanding of what should be written in the scriptures. Next scripture is coming from the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 16. Now, obviously, uh, Yeshua or Yeshua is not what you see in the scriptures. 
you know, you see the name Jesus. But why is that? Again, take a look at my video and to get the, the understanding of, of why that is. But we're going to get a, a small scripture that's going to give a, a brief summary of how the Most High are in Christ look upon that name. Again, the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 16. This is the book of Hosea, chapter 2, verse 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Most High, that thou shalt call me Ishi. So this is Christ speaking, and he's referring to in that day, referring to the last times. That man will call him Ishi. I'll break that down in a moment. Continue. And shall call me no more Baali. Baali, or Baal. So this again is Christ speaking that in that day or in the last days, we will call him Ishi and no more call him Bailey. When you again look up the uh, the Hebrew, and if anyone is, is wanting to understand the Hebrew, I encourage you to uh, look, look up or use a Strong's Concordance. Or if you need to have access to the internet, you can use the Blue Letter Bible because it has a Strong's Concordance tied into it. But the name Ishi, when you look up what is written there, Ishi is actually Yeshaya. And the name Bailey is also is, is resorts to the God named Baal. And then again, when you do your word study and your word search, you can see that Baal is also tied to the Tetragrammaton. The Tetragrammaton is Yahweh, Jehovah, and all other names that come from those four letters of YHWH. But again, this verse is simply stating that Christ is going to come back in the last days and when he does we will refer to him as Ishi or Yeshaya and no longer call him Bailey or any name associated with that all right so that's it on the next topic or, or excuse me that's it for the next for that doctrinal understanding or, or belief so the next thing is understanding who the Holy Spirit is the Holy Spirit is actually a feminine spirit we can get this understanding going to the book of Proverbs chapter 22 uh, I'm sorry Proverbs chapter 8 verses 22 through 35 this is the book of Proverbs chapter 8 verse 22 he goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks verse 23 till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the sore and knoweth not that is for his life. So I was reading out of chapter 7. The so, book of Proverbs, chapter 8, verse 22. The Most High possessed me in the beginning of his ways. So, this is the a spirit speaking. We're going to get the understanding of who is speaking. But it says that the Most High possessed him, possessed the Spirit in the beginning of his ways. Continue. Before his works of old. Verse 23. So before his works of old. So before earth was created, this Spirit existed. Continue. Verse 23. I was set up from everlasting, mm -hmm. from the beginning, or ever the earth was. So again, before the earth was created, this Spirit was, was in existence. Verse 24. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. When there were no fountains abounding with water. Verse 25. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. Verse 26. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. Verse 27. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the deep. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea his decree that the waters should not pass his commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, then I was by him as one brought up with him, and I was daily his delight, rejoicing always before him, rejoicing in the habitable part of his earth, and my delights were with the sons of men. No, I'm sorry. Keep going. Now, therefore, hearken unto me, O ye children, for blessed are they that keep my ways. So here we see that there again, if you read the entire uh, chapter, you'll see that this is a spirit known as wisdom. And this wisdom is actually a female spirit. And this female spirit existed or was created in the beginning before 
the Most High did any creation before Earth was created or anything. We're going to see what spirit that this could have been. Uh, let's go to the book of 1 John chapter 5, verse 7. Who was with the Most High in the very beginning before uh, any other creation was made? And this is a female uh, spirit. Because again, in Proverbs 8, it kept on referring to this wisdom as a she. This is the book of 1 John chapter 5. Verse 7. For there are three that bear record in heaven. Mm -hmm. The Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. And these three are one. So, as we see, there was only three that were in existence in the very beginning. The Father, which we know his name is Ahiah, Ashar Ahiah. The Son, which we just said his name is Yeshia. And the Holy Spirit, which we know is a feminine spirit based off of what we just read in the book of Proverbs chapter 8. And when it states that these three are one, it's referring to one in thought, as in not a one entity, but one in unison, as in they all have the same plans, morals, and goals. They're working together as a family. Okay? The next scripture is coming from the book of Wisdom of Solomon, chapter 9, verse 17. This is the book of the wisdom of Solomon, chapter 9, verse 17. And thy counsel who hath known, except thou give wisdom and send thy Holy Spirit from above. So wisdom is referred to as the Holy Spirit. So again, when we read back in the book of Proverbs, that entire chapter was referring to a, a female spirit referred to as wisdom. And then again, here in the book of the uh, wisdom of Solomon, we can see that that wisdom is is referring to the Holy Spirit. Okay, so that's the next uh, doctrinal understanding or belief. Next, uh, we need, to, in order for us to receive forgiveness for our sins, we must confess our faults. And then we must change from our wicked ways while we continue to walk in the Spirit of Christ. So, how do we do that? Confessing our faults and then continuing to walk in a new life, that means we need to be baptized. So, the next uh, doctrinal understanding or belief is the belief in water baptism. Okay, we're going to get this from the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. This is the book of Acts, chapter 2, verse 38. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Yeshua Christ, for the remission of your sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So we see the instruction is for us to repent and be baptized. And why? For the remission or the forgiveness of sins. So there can be no forgiveness of sins if you were rejecting water baptism. So again, that's the next doctrinal understanding and belief. You have to accept water baptism. Water baptism comes with the full immersion underwater, um, which is comes after you first confessing your faults not to man but confessing your faults to the most high the next scripture is coming from the book of Romans chapter 12 verses 1 through 2 this is the book of Romans chapter 12 verses 1 and 2 beseech you therefore Salaki, I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of the most high that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice holy Acceptable unto the Most High, which is your reasonable service. Mm -hmm. Verse 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of the Most High. So along with the water baptism comes the transforming or the renewing of your mind. One can't just simply choose to be baptized and then continue to walk a wicked lifestyle. Part of being baptized, again, is confessing your faults, then going underwater full submersion to come out as a new creature. When you're coming out as a new creature, that is you walking in a new or different lifestyle, putting away all the, the wickedness that you've done in your past. The next scripture coming from the book of John, chapter 3, verse 5. This is the book of John, chapter 3, verse 5. Yeshua answered, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, 
Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of the Most High. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. So we see here that Christ himself said, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom. How is a man born again? Through water baptism. So again, that's the next uh, doctrinal understanding or belief. So that's five of them. Um, there's five more to go. Next one is we need to separate ourselves from all paganism or un and unrighteousness. What I mean by paganism? That means no longer celebrating holidays or traditions that idolize false gods. For this understanding, we can go to the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verses 14 through 17. This is the book of 2 Corinthians, chapter 6, verse 14 through 17. Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. For what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion have light with darkness? So it says that we are not supposed to be unequally yoked with unbelievers. If you are someone that is supposed to be walking in righteousness in the light, we have should have no fellowship with those that are in darkness. To put plainly, if you want to live a life is, excuse me, I apologize, a righteous lifestyle, you can't continue to live a lifestyle side by side with sinners. There, that's unequally yoked. Continue. And what concord hath Christ with Belial? And what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? Mm -hmm. And what agreement hath the temple of the Most High with idols? For ye are the temple of the living power. As the Most High hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their power, and they shall be my people. Verse 17. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Most High, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you. So even to again, we see that the instruction is for us to be separate from wickedness and unrighteousness. So anything that deals with idolatry or acts of, of wickedness, we need to separate ourselves from. Next scripture is coming from the book of Galatians, chapter four, verses eight through 11. This is the book of Galatians, chapter four, verses eight through 11. How be it then? When ye knew not the Most High, ye did service unto them which by nature are no gods. So, this is again speaking to the children of Israel. Before we once knew the Most High and the truth of his righteousness and his laws and commandments, we are at one point keeping services and traditions unto other gods. Continue. Verse 9. But now after that ye have known the Most High, or rather are known of the Most High, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements? So, so this is a question that Paul was asking the church. How is it that once before you knew the understanding of Christ, uh, you were in the Most High, you were following, uh, falling to these fallen gods and having you know, traditions and holidays and celebrations to these gods. But now, after you've been introduced to the truth, how can you then revert back to those same uh, traditions that you now know are pagan? Continue. Whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage. Verse 10. Ye observe days and months and times and years. I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon your labor. You labor in vain. So again, Paul's asking, did I do all of this in vain? Did I do all this in, for nothing? Did I teach you all this understanding just for you to go back to the same vain worships of, of idolatry before you knew the truth of the Most High? So again, this is just simply showing that prior to Israel uh, having the full understanding of Christ and the Most High, they were following other gods. So just like us, once you come to this understanding, you should then put away all paganism. Once you find out the truth of the Most High's holy days, you should no longer be worshiping Christmas, Easter, Thanksgiving, or anything like that. The Most High gave us righteous holy days to follow. Those should be the, ho the holy days that we subscribe to. Next scripture is coming from the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, verses 2 through 3. This is the book of Jeremiah, chapter 10, verses 2 and 3. Thus saith the Most High, Learn not the way of the heathen, and be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the heathen are dismayed at them. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cutteth a tree out of the forest, 
the work of the hands of the workmen with the axe. So we see that again, the instruction is for us to not learn the way of the heathen or not learn the way of the other nations. The things that the other nations do, their customs and their traditions, we should stay away from. So again, going back into the holidays, a lot of times people will make their statement, well, I don't celebrate this holiday to give honor to a God. I just do it out of tradition or out of a custom. But any custom or tradition that is that a, another nation uh, that they created in order to worship a God, again, we shouldn't do have anything to do with. And in this scripture specifically, we even see a resort uh, specifically refers to the Christmas tree. Okay, how again someone goes to uh, goes to the woods and cuts a tree down with an axe, uh, fasten it with hammer and nails, wrap it with with silver and gold. Again, just like everything else I'm going over today, there's other videos are uh, on my playlist that go on to these specific topics. But I want to keep it general for right now. All right. The next doctrinal understanding is uh, we need to live our lives in accordance with the Most High's commandments. So like I said, if we're going to follow the Most High, we need to keep all of His commandments. That means keeping the dietary law, the, 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 the Ten Commandments, um, as well as following all of the holy days. The first scripture is coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 5, verses 17 through 19. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. So Christ spoke himself that he did not come to destroy the law or the prophets, which is any of the Old Testament. Okay. Again, a lot of people out there believe that because Christ came and died on the cross, we no longer have to keep the laws. That is incorrect. Christ said so uh, himself that that is not what he came to do. Continue. Verse 18. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law, till all be fulfilled. So until everything that I was written of has come to pass, all of the law, all the prophets, all the scriptures are still to stand. Okay. Verse 19. Whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments and shall teach men so, he shall be called the least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. So we see here that anyone that teaches people to, to break God's laws, they will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. So uh, for a lot of you know the Christian pastors that are teaching that we're under grace and it's okay for us to sin, those people will suffer a judgment when it comes to judgment day. They will be considered least in the kingdom of heaven. But for those of us that go out professing the truth of Christ in the scriptures that teach that we should uh, keep the most highest commandments, we will be called great in the kingdom. Okay. The next uh, scripture is coming from the book of Ecclesiastes uh, chapter 12 verse 13. Again, the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13. This is the book of Ecclesiastes, chapter 12, verse 13. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear the Most High and keep His commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. So we see that the whole duty of man is simply just to keep the Most High's commandments. So if that's the whole duty of man for us just to keep the commandments, how then can one say that, we sh that we're not under the commandments, that we're under grace? We shouldn't keep the commandments when that is our whole purpose. The next scripture is coming from the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 3. I'm sorry, 1 John, chapter 5, verse 3. This is the book of 1 John, chapter 5, verse 3. For this is the love of the Most High, that we keep his commandments, and his commandments are not grievous. So, for someone professing to love the Most High, that means you need to be keeping his commandments. That is how we show the Most High that we love him. So, if someone is not keeping the Most High's commandments, then in turn that means that they do not love the Father. Alright, so that's it for that, for that doctrinal belief. The next is... Believing and understanding that 
hell does exist. Hell is a physical place in the center of earth that is meant to hold the souls of the fallen angels and the souls of the wicked. We can get this understanding going first to the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. This is the book of 2 Peter chapter 2 verses 4 through 9. For if the Most High spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment, and spared not the old world, but saved Noah in the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness. I'm sorry, hold up. Start that over. Read that again. This is the book of 2 Peter, chapter 2, verse 4. For if the Most High spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell, and delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. So we see that the fallen angels were cast down into hell. And why were they cast down into hell? They were cast down in hell to await judgment. Continue. Verse 5. And spared not the old world, but saved Noah, the eighth person, a preacher of righteousness, bringing in the flood upon the world of the ungodly, and turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into ashes, condemned them with an overthrow, making them in an end sample unto those that after should live ungodly, and delivered just Lot, vexed with the filthy conversation of the wicked. For that righteous man dwelling among them in seeing and hearing vexed his righteous soul from day to day with their unlawful deeds. The Most High knoweth how to deliver the godly out of temptations and to reserve the unjust unto the day of judgment to be punished. So it says the Most High will reserve the unjust until the day of judgment. So where will these souls be reserved? Their souls will be reserved in a place of, of either torments or paradise, which are both in, in hell or haze, which again is in the center of the earth. Next scripture is coming from the book of Luke chapter 16, verses 22 through 23. This is the book of Luke, chapter 16, verse 22 and 23. And it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So a man died, a righteous man died, and his, his soul was carried away into Abraham's bosom. Abraham's bosom is uh, also in hell. It is just in hell. There's two different chambers. There is the place of torments and then there's a place of paradise referred to as Abraham's bosom. Continue. The rich man also died and was buried. Verse 23. And in hell he lift up his eyes. And in where? In hell he lift up his eyes, mm -hmm. being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. So we see now that a wicked man also died, and his soul was in hell. But where at in hell? In torments. But while he was in torments, he could see paradise. So again, if he was already in hell, in torments, but he could see paradise, again, both Abraham's bosom or paradise are both in hell. Hell is just, again, the center of the earth where souls are being held. Next scripture is coming from the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 28. This is the book of Matthew, chapter 10, verse 28. And fear not them which kill the body, but are not able to kill the soul, but rather fear him which is able to destroy both soul and body in hell. So we see that we're being commanded to not fear someone that can destroy your physical body, but rather we should fear the Most High. Why? Because he has the power to destroy both our body and our souls in hell. Again, another scripture proving that hell is a physical place that does exist. The next uh, doctrinal understanding or belief is, is the knowledge that we only have one life to live. And through this one life, uh, we have to act in our righteousness and prove our works. And that grace alone is not enough. Once our, this life is over, we will all be judged by the things that we do. First scripture is coming from the book of Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27. This is the book of Hebrews, chapter 9, verse 27. And as, as it is appointed unto men once to die, mm -hmm. but after this, the judgment. 
So we see the scripture is very clear. It says that it is appointed unto men once to die. Then after that, the judgment. So there's no such thing as uh, as reincarnation or, you know, anything that says you have more than one shot. This is the only chance that we give to, sh to prove our righteousness. The next scripture is coming from the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. This is the book of Revelation, chapter 20, verses 12 through 15. 15. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before the Most High. And the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of the life, of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. So we see this is now Judgment Day. And on Judgment Day, the books will be opened. And in those books will be written the things that we did. Okay? And that's what we will be judged by. We will be judged by our works. Continue. Verse 13. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged every man according to their works. Verse 14. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So once again, we see that we'll be judged by our, uh, by our deeds, which is the physical things we did. And if we are found unworthy, or then those that are found unworthy, they will be cast into the lake of fire. Next scripture is coming from the book of Luke, chapter 20, verses 35 through 36. We're almost done. This is the book of St. Luke, chapter 20, verse 35 and verse 36. But they which shall be accounted worthy to obtain that world and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage. Neither can they die any more. For they are equal unto the angels and are the children of the Most High, being the children of the resurrection. So we see that those that are counted worthy will one day be changed into the likeness of angels. And at that point, they will no longer suffer a death. So that is all what we're searching for. That's all that we're striving to get to. We're trying to, to, to make, to live these lives as, as righteously as we can so that on judgment day, we are counted as worthy. Now, the last uh, core doctrinal belief is, is that is the understanding that God's word must be first preached to Israel and then to Gentiles. The children of Israel are God's chosen people, which today are the so-called Negroes, Hispanics uh, or Latinos and, and Native Americans. So we know, again, according to scripture, that the so-called Negro, the Latino and the Native American are God's chosen people. So the word must first go to them, but then also to all nations, any nationality, any person that choose that chooses rather to accept Christ as their savior and then chooses to live righteously, uh, worshiping the most high and his commandments can receive eternal life. First scriptures come from the book of Deuteronomy, chapter seven, verse six. This is the book of Deuteronomy, chapter seven, verse six. For thou art an holy people unto the Most High thy power. The Most High thy power hath chosen thee to be a special people unto himself, above all people that are upon the face of the earth. So according to scripture, the children of Israel are a special people, which are above all people on the face of the earth. Now why are they above? Because they are the ones that were given the Most High's laws and commandments. They were given the commandments so that we could first uh, live a righteous lifestyle that was holy or separate from the other nations. And then when of the other nations see our light, we then are instructed to teach them how to honor the Father. The next scripture is coming from the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 16. This is the book of Romans chapter 1 verse 16. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it is the power of the Most High unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. See, so salvation is for everyone that believes, but it does go to the Jew first or the Hebrew first, then to the Greek or the Gentile. 
Now the last scripture is coming from the book of Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. This is the book of Matthew chapter 24 verse 14. And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations and then shall the end come. So this gospel, this core doctrine and belief must be taught and understood through the four corners of the earth before the end can come. So that is why we do the work that we do. That is why we share the information that we share because it was it's our work to continuously spread this information and knowledge to the four corners of the earth. Now again, a quick recap of the core doctrines and beliefs of, of this channel and the fellow brothers and sisters that we, that we serve with. One is believing that the Bible is God's true, holy, and authoritative word. Two, believing and understanding that the father of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob is the creator of all things, and his name is Ahiah, Ashar, Ahiah. Third, believing that Christ is the son of the Most High, and it is only through him that we are able to reach salvation. And Christ's true name in the Hebrew is Yeshua or Yeshaya. Four, believing in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the wisdom that comes from the Most High. And this spirit is a female spirit. Her Hebrew name in the uh, her name in the Hebrew is the Rawak Kwadash, which means the Holy Spirit or the breath of the Most High. Five is that in order for us to uh, be forgiven of our sins, we must accept water baptism. So water baptism is essential in uh, in repentance and confessing our faults and receiving the gift of eternal life. Six is that we must separate ourselves from all paganism and unrighteousness, no longer celebrating um, pagan holidays or tr customs or traditions. We must separate ourselves from all acts of idolatry and wickedness. Seven is when it, that we must keep all of the Most High's commandments, the whole uh, dietary law, worshiping and honoring, or excuse me, I apologize, honoring the, the holy days, the moral laws, all laws are still supposed to be upheld. Eight, believing and understanding that hell does exist. This is a physical place where souls will be held until judgment. Nine, believing and understanding that we will be judged. Knowing that judgment will come to all and that we will be judged by the things that we did, not where, our, uh, not where we believe our hearts are. And then 10, that God's chosen people are still in this earth today. And they are known as the so-called Negroes, Hispanics, and Native Americans. These are God's chosen people. But God or, and, and Christ and his understanding uh, can be reached through all nations. All nations are able to obtain salvation. If they simply accept Christ as their savior, keep the commandments and acknowledge the most high Ahia Ashar Ahia as their father. So with that, I hope that through all this information, uh, again, everyone is able to have a, a better and clear understanding of exactly what the core doctrines and beliefs are of myself and my other fellow and brothers and sisters. Um, and we believe that these are the true understandings of, of Christ that he spoke of, that he taught himself. And now, like I said multiple times, if there was a specific uh, doctrinal question that you had a question about, please take a chance to look uh, through the rest of my videos on the playlist because I have more detailed information on all of these specific topics in general. All right. But as always, uh, I hope that this was an edifying lesson. I appreciate you clicking subscribe, watching the channel. I want to thank Brother Yassaf for bringing forth the reading for me today. Huh. All praises to Ahia. All praises to Ahia. No, no matter what you do, remember to always go out there and seek the truth. Shalom. Shalom.